Hello and welcome to the third video of the FP3 chapter, Vectors. Very quick question on the screen here, what are these solid shapes called and how would you calculate their volumes? I hope you recognize this one as a triangle based pyramid or a tetrahedron. This one you may not have heard of before is called a parallelopiped. The volume, fairly easy, you do the base shape times the perpendicular height as with any prism. And over here the base shape times the perpendicular height divided by three because the volume of a pyramid is exactly one third that of the surrounding prism. We're going to use these two shapes in the video today as well as this thing called the scalar triple product. But first let's make sure we see how the vectors connect here. The vectors we can use to define the shape by considering this edge, this edge and this edge the three non-parallel edges, and that is enough to define the parallelopiped. To find the volume then, we need the area of the base shape, the parallelogram, and the perpendicular height, h. Hope you can see that h is the magnitude of a times the cosine of the angle I've called phi. And the area, if you remember our previous video, the area of the parallelogram on the base here is the magnitude of B cross C. So the volume is equal to the magnitude of B cross C times the magnitude of A times the cosine of phi. Now that looks very, very similar to a dot product. Magnitude of something times the magnitude of something else times the cosine of an angle. And if we can confirm that this angle is the angle between the vector a and the answer vector of b cross c, then we can write this as a dot product between b cross c and a. To convince yourself of this, you can return to your right hand rule. If you put your forefinger along b, and your middle finger along C, you should find that your thumb points in the vertical direction along H. So these are indeed here and here, so phi is indeed the angle between the two. So this is a dot product that has within it a cross product, and this is what we call the scalar triple product. It's called the scalar triple product because there are three vectors involved and it will produce a scalar answer. And you might think if it produces a scalar answer, why do we need the magnitude signs? And that's a fair question. The only reason they are there is because it might not be clear which one B and C to put first in order to give you a positive answer, i.e. this direction rather than this direction. So that's just making sure that you get out of this a positive answer rather than a negative answer because obviously you can't have a negative volume for a 3d shape if you wanted to you could put in the general terms for the column vectors and do this and you would get this horrible mess but i would suggest you remember this rather than remembering this now there are two things to note about this the first is that the scalar triple product is cyclic. That means so long as you keep the same order in a left to right cycle, so A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, then these three results are the same. And that also tells you that if any of these two vectors are the same, then you get zero. And that's because this cycles to this and both of these cycle to this and A cross itself is zero. A vector dot with the zero vector gives you zero. And I hope that makes sense in terms of what this shape here is because if any of these three defining vectors are parallel, then you end up collapsing your 3D shape to a 2D shape and it doesn't have any volume. So these are two little useful properties. 
Now the volume of a tetrahedron, while it's one third of the surrounding prism, is exactly one sixth of the surrounding parallelepiped, which in this case is more useful because if you've got three non-parallel defining vectors a, b, and c, then you can do the scalar triple product again and just put a one-sixth in front of it. So here is an example. We're going to find the volume of a tetrahedron, and we're told that the vertices have coordinates as given here. Now, none of these are the origin so the diagram I've left in the bottom right, I'm just going to change it slightly. I'm going to make this D A. So I can call this D A. This will be point B, so I can call this D B. And this point will be C, so I can call this vector D C like this. And then if I just randomly assign A, B and C to my points. And then, of course, the common point D then I can work out each of these dA, d to b, d to c, and put it into my formula. So dA, in terms of position vectors, of course, is a minus d, and the position vectors use the same numbers as the coordinates. So we've got 1, 1, minus 1, minus 0, 4, five. So I have, um, let me do this across the way. One minus three and six. Next, D to B. Two, four, minus one. Minus zero, four, five. Of course, it doesn't matter which one you choose to be the common point for each of the vectors, so long as you're consistent. D to C. And of course, if one of them happens to be the origin, then that would be the easiest one to use. So here are my three vectors that I'm going to use in the scalar triple product. And it's a tetrahedron, so I'm going to use the volume is equal to one sixth of the scalar triple product. It doesn't matter too much about the order I put these in because of that magnitude symbol and the cyclic nature of the scalar triple product. So we've got one sixth of one minus three minus six dot with the result of this cross product. So the top element is zero minus 24. The middle element minus 18, minus, minus 14. And the bottom element, minus 8, minus 0. So the dot product gives me minus 24, plus 12, plus 48, which is 36. And 1 sixth of 36 is 6 cube units. And if we had used these in a slightly different order, we might have ended up with a minus 36 out of this, but because of the magnitude, we still would have got the positive 6 volume at the end. So that should be enough for you to have a go at the questions in exercise 5c, and maybe I'll see you in the next video.